Welcome to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast, addressing all aspects of the digital enterprise, inspiring connection without boundaries and creation without limits. Thank you for tuning in. Here are your hosts, Tom Singer and Craig Brown. Hey there, and welcome to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Thank you so much for choosing our little show that was designed to be the place for discussions around the resources used in and around PLM. The Digital Enterprise Society is a forum for the exchange of ideas surrounding the tools, processes, and practices used across the product lifecycle. To learn more, visit digitalenterprisesociety.org. My name is Tom Singer, and as you know, I have the honor to co-host this show every single week with Craig Brown. Craig is an industry veteran and former PLM leader at General Motors. Hey, Craig, here we are again. Hey, Tom. Good to hear your voice, and um, I'm uh, happy to be doing this again. We, we have something a bit different today, and uh, I hope the audience likes it. Awesome. Well, you know, every week we try to just shake things up. We try to bring new ideas to this podcast that through the interviews that are going to help people enhance and grow their careers. And today we are joined by Probjot Singh. He is the CEO and founder of Pies. And what they do is they help large enterprises improve their operational excellence and their efficiencies of their core business practices. Now, what they do is they take a look at all of the end-to-end -end processes, and then they find the places where you can improve. So we're going to have some fun today. Hey, uh, Probjot, welcome to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. My, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on today, Don Craig. I'm excited to get going here. So give us a little bit of your background and how you came to founding Pies. Yeah, so uh, I've been in enterprise software most of my life. Uh, I've been with startups for the last 20 odd years. Uh, you know, I joined a little old company called Wiley Technology uh, right after the dot-com bust uh, that just raised their first round of funding. It was, you know, I think I was employee number 14 and I was interviewed by 10 of the 12 people that worked there at that time, right? So uh, it, it was just uh, an amazing place where we built something from nothing. And, you know, Wiley solved this problem in the early days of the internet where when you'd go to book a rental car or a hotel room or fill out a credit card application, the website would just go kaput, right? And, and no one knew why, because you had these monolithic Java applications, .NET applications running in the background. And Wiley figured out how to peek inside of those applications to identify where the issues were and the, what piece of code was, was broken, right? And I always thought, well, wouldn't it be great if you could do this at the business process level, right? So instead of looking at the code to see why an application breaks down, look at where the bottlenecks are end-to-end -end business process, right? At a, a, really at a workflow orchestration level. And that, that's what Wiley, that's what, uh, you know, Wiley did. Um, and Pies today kind of seeks to do that for the, the business process and we're charting a new space, so to speak. Well, Prabhda, welcome. It, that's interesting. I, I sometimes wonder why um, entrepreneurs like yourself create companies, and I, th I think you've answered it, there's all this this knowledge, insight, or maybe just data, maybe it's all noisy, um, that, that helps drive a, a company. And, um, you know, I grew up in a couple large companies, one small company, and it was always amazing how um, people did things because they've always done them a certain way, right? That's right. And, and when you would ask them, well, why do we fill out this form? Well, because we always have, right? And and there never was this this feedback loop that you know I'm a controls guy, so I'm looking for feedback that says, well, is it useful? Are we making good decisions? So, um, as we were getting ready to start today's uh, podcast, you brought up this point about um, looking at the data, and and I, I'd like you to to expand on that a bit more. What what can the data tell us about how business processes are working? Yeah, you, you know, data can tell us a lot. Uh, you know, these days, because there's a digital footprint for almost everything that we do, right? If you are, let, let's say, on the production line and everything from when an order comes in to, uh, you know, when it goes through sort of 
uh, you know, the start of production to when the manufacturing process ends to when that product ships and gets delivered, there's a digital footprint for every single thing that happens from start to finish. And the data can give us an understanding of what are the different ways that work gets done. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and historically, you know, when companies think about process improvement, it's this really expensive consulting exercise. You bring in management consultants, pay them millions of dollars, and you get a report that says, okay, hey, these are the things that you need to do. Uh, now, what we do is we use software to look at that digital footprint and identify there's 20 different ways this product can go from creation to finish or 200 or 2,000 ways, right? And mm -hmm. which routes are efficient, which routes are inefficient, which path costs the least money, which costs the most money, right? So you can do all kinds of analysis. And then for the, let's say we pick a path that costs a lot, is very expensive to execute. Mm -hmm. You can you can then drill into that workflow and figure out, well, why is it expensive, right? Is, is it mm -hmm. because people are doing a lot of things manually that maybe we can automate? Uh, is it expensive because you've got some ping pong happening, right? Like, uh, like everyone generally has a sense of how a process works, right? And, and in big companies, the closer you, you are to the step that you control or you work on, you're going to be accurate. But as you start to kind of broaden to that entire process, it's kind of like a gut feeling of, okay, this is how this process works. So people are always amazed at how complicated and convoluted processes actually are once we hook our software in and give them like real-time visibility. So, so can, you, can you share with our audience what, what, what causes that? What causes it to get complicated? I, I have my own theories, but I'm interested in yours. Yeah, well, look, uh, anytime you've got a process that involves more than one person, it's going to get complicated, right? And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and the reason for that is you are, you know, you're dependent on someone else to do something before maybe you can do it, right? Think about like a claim management system or if we're, you know, looking, thinking about kind of in the PLM context, uh, th think about sort of, you know, going from design uh, to actual engineering, right? Maybe you've got technical review in the middle. So you've got mul multiple steps in, in any process where you have dependencies on other people. Uh, you might uh, find an issue in a particular uh, part of that process that then needs to get kicked back to someone else, mm -hmm. right? So understanding kind of how long things take at each step of that process, how long you're waiting for people, right, at, at, at each step of that process, and what are the different kind of uh, paths that follow is really, really important. So, so I think one of the things I learned was um, different processes at different times have a different order of decisions, right? That's and right. especially in a big manufacturing company, by and large, that's probably driven by finance. And, and so it's not so much a human being's productivity as it was, we got to go ask the bank for more money to change the factory, right? Or something akin to that. So, so then when your business changes, you no longer are mass producing. Um, well, my friends in the car business, they're, they're moving pretty quickly from internal combustion engines to electric drive motors, right? right. And, and those motors are actually simpler. So the order of decisions will be different. Um, but more importantly, how they get energy is really different, right? <laughs> and, sure. and they have this new risky thing called a uh, lithium ion or some other technology battery, which, which the car business doesn't have hundreds of years of experience, or if you will, the data, the measurements. And so I think the order of decisions is, is sometimes not understood. And, and I think if you understood it, then you'd understand, you know, frankly, some of that data is, it's noisy because it's it's bad or not bad maybe uh, the wrong word incomplete measurements. So I liked what you pointed out. The further you get away from your area of expertise, the less you understand the context of the data, and so you can't even judge it. You, you're going to assume it's accurate. And in fact, any good measurement engineer knows 
oh, it's only as good as where you put the sensor, <laughs> right? And and a lot of times it's bad. It's 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 noisy. And so, so do you see that in business processes where maybe if you sample from one part of the business, you get one set of data, but if you sample from an earlier or a later part, you should be measuring the same thing, but you get different results. And and what I'm curious about is how do you solve that? Is it as simple as pointing it out, or or do you have to conduct a debate and and eventually get to a winner? Yeah, well, you, you know, in in God we trust, right? Everyone else bring data. Okay, uh, that, that's a good phrase. And, right? and where did that come from? That <laughs> lots of people say that, but do you remember where it came from? I actually don't. Is, is that Einstein? Well, it, it came from you guys out in out out in Silicon Valley. I mean, it. The Google guys, for sure, um, um, Sergey and, and his counterpart, and of course they're from where I live, which is over by Michigan, and and so um, yeah, I think that that that's really correct because you you got to want data, you got to want to value data, and then when you find it's bad, go take some more measurements, right? That's right, that's right, and you know I'll give you an example uh, of like you you brought a good point in terms of depending on where you measure, you might get different results. And if you measure at two different points, you might actually get good results at both those points, right? But if you look at the process in totality, you, you can actually get really, really good insights. And, uh, you know, so we work with a large transportation co uh, company um, that, that actually also does a lot of sort of uh, capital expenditure work. Okay. And they've got an amazing PLM system, right, where they can deliver... 90 plus percent of the time on time on budget right they've got it down to a science and then they've got an asset management system which also works really really well they've got a good understanding of sort of maintenance requests and how you know how those requests can be uh are resolved and and farmed out right but you've got these two silos of data yeah <laughs> right without any interaction between the two of them so what they're looking for visit for from help for us is help us understand what's happening in the downstream maintenance right of of these assets so that we can get insights and feed that back into the the plm system right yeah uh, and it, bravo exactly <laughs> that that's what digitalization is as opposed to just turning paper into you know computer files and using them right. somehow digitalization is being able to ask that question, right? Um, and so uh, that's interesting. Have you got other examples, like uh, besides the shipping company that's trying to manage its fleet? Yeah, I mean, we've got, look, we do a lot of work. Like, so the US Air Force is probably uh, our, our biggest customer. Uh, we, 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 do, we do a ton of work in terms of helping, uh, you know, improve maintenance operations. Uh, you know, there's, there's all these maintenance processes that have to happen, right, on, on aircraft. Uh, a check, B check, C check, right after so many hours of flight time and these mm -hmm. isochronal processes. And, you know, just like with, with any maintenance operation, it takes longer than you expect that it should, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and of course, with the, with the Air Force, there's, there's national security concerns, right, around aircraft availability, mission capability rates mm -hmm. of aircraft. So being able to streamline that is extremely important. And, you know, whether we're, we're talking about kind of maintenance processes or energy transition, like you were mentioning earlier, right? Understanding kind of the end-to-end -end process is critical because, you know, with energy transition and, uh, you know, sort of the engagements that we see, like supply chain is extremely critical these days, right? So if, mm -hmm. if you don't have the semiconductors or the, the, the batteries, right, you, you're not going to be able to produce product that you need to produce. So, being able to understand anomalies upstream today is extremely important because it helps you understand how it's going to, those anomalies are going to impact your business tomorrow. Right. Yeah. You, you know, this, this is a good topic. We've, we've talked about it a couple of times on the podcast is what the heck happened in March of 2020, at least from a car guy's point of view. And, and what happened is they were almost too quick in responding to the fall off of sales. Right, so the the car, especially car companies, they got really good at adjusting um, build volumes in their factories based upon fluctuating demand in the marketplace. And of course, the beginning of the pandemic, everybody got scared. Right. Well, unwisely, 
they slowed down orders. Well, what was happening at the same time? All of us were buying new equipment at home because we were going to work remotely, right, or upgrading equipment. And and all of a sudden, this, the chip manufacturers, who for lots of reasons, some of them not very good, by the way, got leaned out to the point where a lot of it, a, a vast majority of chip production is not in the United States, right? It's, it's sitting in other places of the world, largely in Asia. And, and all of a sudden, now we can't ship parts. We don't have available parts. And so, you know, I can remember a time in the car business where as we sourced parts, this just wasn't allowed. Meaning we always had multiple sources and we always had assembly and manufacturing of key components, including ICs, within a couple hundred miles of the plant. Right, we we wouldn't have gone this global, and so so I think your your example is a really good one. How in stu- business schools should be studying this for the next five years? How did this little hiccup occur when, in fact, these industries used to manage the supply chain really well for weather disruption and you know and other kinds of constraints? Right, I mean, a lot of the material needed, the raw material for electric motors and lithium ion batteries also doesn't come from the United States. It comes from other places, right? It doesn't come from Western Europe yeah. either. Right. And so, so managing raw material availability is, is another part of the game. And th- these are all engineering challenges as opposed to just business flow challenges. But I think that the decision process back in March of 2020, I, 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 I know some folks, friends of mine are still in the business and I'm very sure they have restudied it and have made adjustments <laughs> and, and I'm sure the data drove them, but it was a really painful lesson that how is it possible? We used to drive the chip industry and now we're sitting, we car guys, and now we're sitting here a victim of it because we didn't, we didn't deal with a, a disruption. You know, it's really funny because 90 days later, pickup and sales of cars, all kinds of cars, including big trucks, um, started going way up again. And so it's like, that was only a two and a half month dip. And, and then by the time they came out of the dip, they couldn't catch back up. And then, you know, eight months later, there's this big snafu in supply chain. So that, That's right. And, y- you know, the, the issue is people don't have fine-grained understanding of sort of the, that, that end-to-end process, right? Because mm-hmm. you have to be able to, A, understand an issue before it actually happens in order to be able to respond in today's world, right? Because things move so quickly. Like, if you know that you have an issue after you have an issue you're 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 behind the curve right yeah you're and, already behind and, right <laughs> and and we've we so we have this ai engine that actually takes in data right so we 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 will bring in sort of process data right in terms of what are the actions that are happening uh, at each step of that process we we look at upstream supply chain data that com- is coming into our platform we look at kind of downstream distribution data whether it's 3pl or you know, whatever you're using for delivery, then you bring in employee data, right? So that's that's an important vector because that gives you an understanding of, you know, well, how is the plant in Phoenix doing versus the plant in San Jose? Yeah, right. Uh, right, seniority of people. People will even bring in pay band information. And then customers will bring in CRM data, right? Customer data in mm-hmm. terms of, you know, we want to understand, okay, how, if I am looking at order management process, how are people in one region being affected versus another region from a customer perspective or mm-hmm. uh, by industry or by you know, size of customer, what have you. So you bring all that into our system and it's like a Vitamix, right? We blend it really, really well. Okay. And you get out of it, you know, a, a good understanding of the process map of what are the different workflows, where there's hotspots, where there's bottlenecks. And then we have this sort of AI insights engine, right? That says, uh, that looks at the data in real time and will make predictions mm-hmm. uh, that you know you've got too much of this component, you don't have enough of this component to uh, you know meet your meet your orders, or we're noticing uh, a, a slowdown in production right in Phoenix, whatever, yeah. right? So, and, and then you can take action against that, right? So, so you you touched on the term workflow, and a lot of times in our discussions with with folks, processes and workflows are are synonyms. Um, what what do you say? I mean, I, I think it's a very confusing topic. It's one thing to say, you know, I do something, and then you review, review it, and then you give it to Tom. It's a very different thing to say the three of us together are producing a podcast, right? <laughs> so, so is there? Do, do you coach people on this this? I guess the first, the definition of these two terms, 
And then are the subtleties or the interactions between them? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great, that's a great question. And you're right, there's a lot of confusion on, on, on this topic. So uh, a, a workflow is one instance of a process being executed, right? So you okay. could have multiple workflows. So let's say, you know, let's say there's the three of us, right? And um, I initiate a process, uh, Craig, you, you execute that process, you let's say approve it and and then Tom closes it out, right? So that's one workflow. Uh, versus if I execute it and then Tom approves it and doesn't need to go through a closing out process, that's a second workflow, right? So the the uh, so typically a process consists of many different workflow variants mm -hmm. in the Six Sigma context, right? So yeah, yeah. Uh, so when we're analyzing a process, we're interested in looking at which Cases are, let's say, the outliers, maybe mm -hmm. a couple of standard deviations from the mean if I'm optimizing on cost or on uh, execution time, you know, whatever my optimization scope is. And then we look to see, okay, which workflow variants contribute to those, okay. those cases being slow or costly. Yeah. And, and then we analyze those variants to identify what's common about them. Right or are, is there are there, and once we understand what the issue is, now you can resolve that issue. So so that's excellent. So that's clear. Um, so maybe we can tie this into operational excellence. So I I got exposed to that. I got trained in all that because I was a big corporate. You know, I had a big corporation. Yeah. We learned it from another big corporation. Um, <laughs> does operational excellence apply to small companies, or is it is it somewhere a, a thing that you just got to have? thousands of samples before you can make it work? Well, it, it, it applies to any company, right? From okay. a, from, right, because look, you wanna be executing your business as effectively as possible, right? Like if I'm a, you know, like if I'm running, let's say uh, a, 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 a car uh, mechanic operation, uh, I've got some core processes that I wanna make sure that they, they're being executed really, really well, right? Whether it's sort of an oil change or if I'm, uh, mm -hmm. you know, onboarding new customers, right? Uh, but for small companies, you, know, you could typically do it on an Excel sheet, right? Because right. I, I might have 50 customers or 100 customers. I probably know all of them by name, right? Uh, but I, I care about operational excellence because if those customers don't have an amazing experience, they're going to go somewhere else, right? right. Uh, now, let's take it to the other side of a large enterprise like General Motors, right? Uh, uh, where I've got you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of customers, right? And I've got millions and millions of orders that are coming through. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't do that on Excel sheet anymore, right? right. You've, got a, you, you've got to have an understanding of, you know, what the key processes are and, and, and understand the workflow variants of each of those processes, everything from, you know, onboarding a dealer to warranty to, you mm -hmm. know, my sales process, right? These are all kind of critical processes that span geographies and, right. you know, external stakeholders. So that's where PIES comes in, right? And, okay. and we'll help you understand what's actually happening, identify where there's issues, help you resolve those issues, right? Using software. Mm -hmm. And then once you make changes, we'll actually show you, well, you made this change, did it make things better or did it make things worse? Yeah, right. right. So, so another thing I noticed on your, your um, um, biography, I guess I would call it online, was, yeah. was uh, talking about agile methods in the context of processes. So, yes. so, um, we hear a lot about scrumming and going fast and keeping the customer involved, but you know, like a car customer, well, they just, they just want a product that works with the, probably with the right microprocessor, but that's a whole, we already <laughs> talked about that. But, but t talk about agile methods and processes. I mean, it, it, do these individual workflows, this in, instantiation of a process, do you give them flexibility to be agile and, and just how agile are they? Are they allowed to change everything or do, are there some guidelines they have to follow? So, so the, the, you know, people say process and they're thinking manufacturing, you know, these 10 steps in a certain order the same way all the time. They don't think agile at all. Agile sounds like 
here's it, Apollo 13. Here's a bucket of parts. Uh, <laughs> you got to, you got 12 hours to figure out how to make it work <laughs> so they can come back. Right. right I, I mean, right. it's very much not a process. It's very much a creative, innovative thing. Right. So, yeah, you, you know, we have a lot of companies that come to us and say, you know, help us, un- help, help us, uh, help us understand the effectiveness of our development process. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and, you know, when you think about, so agile is great, uh, right? Because like in the, in, in the old days, we spent six months doing a BRD and a PRD and, uh, right. you know, then spending six more months actually developing the thing. And by the time you released it a year later, it might not be relevant anymore. Right. So right. agile is fantastic. It's all about go, 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 go. Let's execute and deliver product quickly. Uh, but, you know, for any process, you want to be able to measure the effectiveness of the of, of what you're doing. And mm-hmm. people don't just build software. I mean, at least, you know, we hope they don't, right? They, they don't just sort of say, okay, let's create a new release of the software. There's always a business goal, right? Behind uh, digitization initiatives, behind transformation, behind a new feature, uh, right? I want to be able to do something faster, better, cheaper, right? I don't care what it is. There's some right. intended business goal. So as you're developing and you're releasing things to the market, it's critical to be able to measure how that release is helping affect that business goal. And today that's not done in, in, <laughs> in agile development. And it's something that, you know, we spend a lot of time with our customers on in terms of you don't just want to release a, a, a feature or an application and then move on to the next thing, which is what happens, right? Because people are right. busy. You've got to be able to measure the effectiveness of that release. Yeah, uh, this is excellent. I, I Bravo. I was going to ask you one more question about lessons learned, but you just nailed it, right? Which is if you got the wrong measures... Um, you, you really won't know, and, and those measures should be um, confirmed with real customers, paying customers, right? Okay. The, the ones that drove you to build that widget in the first place. That's so, right. That's right. Um, it, that's really insightful. You know, all of us are being affected by fuel prices right now. And a couple of years ago, the goal was, oh, I want a comfortable ride that's connected to the network right now. Well, right now, I want an efficient ride that that lowers my <laughs> my energy budget, at least if I still drive in a gas engine car, right? So so I, I think the point I'm making with everybody there is the measures matter. And measures too can change. That's part of why Agile's so good is if the measures change because the marketplace has changed due to some outside force, then you got to be able to adjust to that. So being Agile is a part of the key to that. So, well, Prabhjot, I appreciate your, your time today. And it's been interesting chatting with you. And I wish you the best of luck. Um, I do think process modeling and process intelligence is a weakness of PLM systems. It's one of the reasons I, I got you here. Now, they're very good at collecting data, <clears throat> but there's still this missing piece of the puzzle, and, and you nailed it at the end, which is, well, what's the measure of success? And, and I think, um, well, I encourage you to keep doing just that and, and feel free to come into big enterprises that have lots of engineering and apply the same principles. We, we need to do more of it not less of it. So thanks again. Tom. Yeah, my, 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 my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on today, uh, Craig and Tom. And, uh, you know, would, would, would love the opportunity if any of your listeners are, are interested in learning more about process intelligence, uh, you know, ch- check us out on our website, pies.com. Uh, okay. And I'd, I'd love to have a, a conversation, see if we can help. That's awesome. And it's pies.com. That's P-Y-Z-E.com. Uh, We really appreciate you being here and we appreciate everybody who tuned in and listened. You know, we would like you to join us here every single week for more thoughts, ideas, and actionable information in and around product lifecycle management. The Digital Enterprise Society is the place for the exchange of ideas around digital manufacturing tools. Go check us out at digitalenterprisesociety.org. You've been listening to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Learn more about what you've heard here today at digitalenterprisesociety.org. Join us again next week for more Connection Without Boundaries and Creation Without Limits.